So as we begin to think about how to talk about multi-component systems, systems with more than one component in them, an awful lot of interesting multi-component systems are solutions, can be described as solutions. So let's make sure we understand uh, the terminology, uh, how to use some vocabulary that we use to describe solutions typically. So first question is maybe what is a, a solution? So a solution is a mixture of two substances in which, importantly, one substance is homogeneously dispersed within the other. So you're familiar with solutions. Let's take as our first example, um, I don't know, let's say sugar and water. So if you just dissolve some sugar in water, you've created a solution. Uh, let's say homogeneous mixture. And the reason we can call this a solution is because after I've stirred the sugar into the water, the, the sugar molecules are dissolved in the aqueous solution. They're homogeneously dispersed. Everywhere I look, I can find an equal proportion of sugar molecules and water molecules in that uh, mixture, in that solution. So since the mixture is a homogeneous mixture, at every length scale, no matter how finely I look, I get an equal uh, proportion of uh, the same proportion of sugar molecules in every portion of that uh, solution. So that's what a solution is. We often talk about solutions in terms of solutes and solvents. The solute is usually considered to be the minority component of that solution. If I dissolve a small amount of sugar in a larger amount of water, we say that the sugar is the solute, the water is the solvent. So the solvent is the, the background into which I'm dissolving the solute to make this homogeneous mixture that I'm calling a solution. So not everything is a solution, of course, and I can give you some counterexamples. So sugar water, I'll say, is a solution. Um, if I mix other things with water, they may not form a solution. If I mix oil and water, let's say you mix yourself some salad dressing, uh, which I guess would be oil and vinegar, same idea, but let's just mix two, two component solution, oil and pure water. I can shake them up like you would with a salad dressing, for example, and get them to appear to mix. But if I let them rest, of course, the, the oil and the water will separate. The oil will float on top of the water. Uh, so the fact that it doesn't remain dissolved, the, the two separate from one another, means the mixture is not homogeneous. There's oil on the top and, and water on the bottom. So that's not a homogeneous mixture. I can um, call it a mixture, perhaps, but I can't call that a solution. That's not a solution because the oil doesn't dissolve in the water. It doesn't mix homogeneously with the water. Terminology we would use in that case is to say those two uh, fluids, those two liquids are immiscible, which just means not mixable. I can't mix the oil and the water to form a solution. They will separate from one another, so they're immiscible. I can also say that one of them is insoluble in the other. If I can't dissolve oil in water, then its oil is insoluble in water. I can dissolve sugar in water, so that's sugar is soluble in water. Let's do another food-related example. So here's another mixture. Milk is actually a very complicated mixture with lots of components, of course. Um, and it certainly looks uh, like one solution. It won't separate the way oil and water will. Your, your milk sitting in your refrigerator is uh, going to remain uh, some substances mixed throughout other ones, some fat, if you have uh, full fat milk uh, mixed throughout the water that is the solvent of the milk mixture. But in fact, this is not a solution. It may be difficult to tell with the naked eye, but if you look very closely, especially uh, under uh, some magnification, what you'll see is there's globules or clusters of fat molecules near each other and other regions that are mostly aqueous. Uh, so the, the fat is not homogeneously dispersed throughout the solvent, but it's located in little pockets throughout the solvent. So the fact that it's not perfectly homogeneously mixed that means that we don't actually call milk a solution. Uh, we would call that an emulsion. So if we manage to get the fat not separating, not, not floating on top of the water, well uh, distributed throughout the uh, entire sample, but 
persisting in, in clusters like dissolving light, the oil sticking with the oil and the, the water sticking with the water, and clusters separated from one another, we typically call that an emulsion. And there's interesting chemistry to explore about how it is the fat becomes um, suspended within that emulsion without fully dissolving, but we'll postpone those for another day. And in order to talk about more features of solutions, and, and we can also talk about what phases the, a solution has to have. So everything I've talked about so far has been liquids. Sugar water, oil and water, milk, those are all liquids. Solutions don't actually have to involve liquids. Let's say I have a solid chunk of brass. Brass, it turns out, is uh, what we call an alloy. An alloy is a mixture of uh, more than one metal. So this is a binary alloy composed of two different metals. The, if I mix the correct proportions of copper and zinc, they will essentially dissolve one another. If I have a homogeneous mixture of copper and zinc, normally we would call that an alloy. It's a little bit unusual to call it a solution, but it's certainly uh, possible to call that a solid solution. We can say that brass is a solid solution of copper and zinc. So you don't have to have uh, solutions that are composed purely of liquids, although that's the, the, the more traditional uh, case where you'd use the terminology of a, a solution. And in fact, when we're thinking about phases, although the solvent is usually but not always a liquid, we can dissolve any sort of uh, material in that uh, liquid solvent to obtain a solution. So for example, we've, we've talked about several examples up here of uh, solutions of, in fact, I'll come back to this one, um, of liquids. Here's an example. If I have carbonated water, the way to prepare carbonated water, the solute was originally carbon dioxide probably in the gaseous phase. If I take gaseous carbon dioxide and dissolve it in water, what I get is a solution of CO2 in water, or perhaps the chemical byproducts that CO2 pr produces when it uh, dissolves in water. But the point is, I've dissolved a gas in a liquid to make that solution. If I want to dissolve a liquid in another liquid, maybe an example I could use here would be any sort of alcoholic beverage. So that is, typically have more than two components, but if I take ethanol and I dissolve it in water in some proportions, then I've got an alcoholic beverage. Uh, alcoholic beverage is not pure water, they're not pure ethanol, they're a solution of ethanol and water. So that's an example where a liquid has been dissolved in another liquid, here's a gas dissolved in another liquid. We've seen one example where we have a solid dissolved in a liquid. I can give a different example. Salt water, ocean water would be solids like sodium chloride or other salts dissolved in water. So the phase of the solute before you dissolve it in the solution, before you prepare the solution, might have been a gas, might have been a liquid, might have been a solid completely irrelevant what the phase of the, of the solute is before it dissolves. It might end up in a liquid solution. In some cases, we might even talk about solid solutions. So those are several terminological features of solutions uh, that are important to be able to talk about as we move forward and, and talk about uh, multi-component thermodynamics. And uh, what we'll do next is move on to talk about how to talk about the properties of a solution. In particular, we need to be able to talk about not just what the components of a solution are, but the relative amounts of those two components. So we need to be able to talk about concentration. That's coming next.